well, uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to listen to my discussion here. Uh, I'm trying to shed some light on ICOs and give you a little bit of information as to what I do. I consult on multiple uh, ICOs in this industry and uh, try to create ones that have a gold standard. So when we present them to the ecosystem, we know that the business use case is going to be proper, as well as the actual token creation, the development of the uh, technology as all going to be um, consistent with what we would like to see the uh, industry move forward with. So the reason for using this method of fundraising, um, essentially it allows traditional retail and any investor to uh, provide funding to a project where they do not even have to have the actual uh, technology built and it gives them the capabilities of raising these funds and using these funds to ensure that their concept actually comes to fruition and becomes a reality. Uh, brief history, the first ICO was MasterCoin back in 2013. And I don't know if many of you know this, uh, Ethereum actually did their own ICO raise as well. That's how they were able to uh, consistently become the next evolution of what we are seeing in this industry, which is the ERC-20 token, which allows other companies to utilize it to do fundraising. So the initial boom. Um, essentially, everyone jumped onto this market when it became um, mainstream media in about January 2017. Uh, and we've seen it just continuously increase and increase with more and more ICO offerings on a daily basis. I myself get many in my uh, inbox on a daily basis. What we're seeing now is the market is so diluted that you have to really ensure that you research the projects, research the team, and research the actual use case that they're trying to improve in this industry to ensure that it's a feasible project and you're not going to actually lose your investment. So what do you receive for your investment? Essentially at this time, um, the token provider only has to, or sorry, the, the token founder only has to provide you with the token based on their fundraising. So essentially when you provide them capital, their reward to you is their token, which we allow you to trade it on the open market or uh, utilize it for whatever the use case is that they're going to be presenting. Regulations. Uh, I myself am from Canada. Uh, we have very, very strict regulations. Uh, I've noticed that uh, the U.S. Singapore, a lot of uh, major com uh, countries are coming to try and regulate this, but on more of a uh, localized method, when this is an international crowdfunding. So you have to understand these regulators are just trying to regulate internally in their, in their own country, but it does not give the capabilities of understanding where they need to see that this is an international crowdfund raise, so they need to understand that the regulations need to be more global as opposed to localized. So venture capital versus initial coin offerings. Venture capital is uh, the traditional method of raising capital for uh, startups. Uh, essentially, they have to provide a large piece of equity uh, to receive their initial funding. And then it gives that capability of that venture capitalist to um, have a say in how they want to see that business progress, which usually stunts the growth of that technology company or that startup because now they have to have an advisor in who's just looking at the monetary gain as opposed to looking at the actual progression of this technology and allowing them to move forward uh, as opposed to just worrying about the bottom dollar. What's next? So as I said already, the ICO market is so congested uh, with multiple offerings. I think there was almost 100 in October alone. Uh, I know myself that there's a multitude coming out daily uh, all over the globe, all have great projects. However, it's so diluted at this point that everybody's just trying to capitalize on this easy method of raising funds. So what we need to do is we need to ensure that these individuals who are providing these offerings actually have a tangible product and are progressing this technology, which is blockchain. So. I actually do this with all of my clients when I uh, do an ICO for them. So what I've done is I've just done the architecture of how we ensure their ICO uh, meets the gold standard. So the first thing that these people need to do is they need to describe their ICO. Like what are they trying to get across to the audience and which audience are you trying to approach? 
Um, when you do an ICO, you should try to go after your current market of people who are going to be interested in your project as opposed to just sh throwing out your, uh, your entire offering to everyone and just seeing who you can cast within that net of those fish. The white paper. It's very, very important for your white paper. Um, also to have an MVP, but I'll get into that after. The white paper does not have to be an exorbitant amount of pages. It does not have to be 50 plus pages. It needs to be a co contextualized, small, condensed version of their use case, their technology, their progression, their roadmap, their team, their advisors, and with what they're actually going to do with the token distribution, how much money they're raising, and how they're going to utilize that capital when it comes to the creation of their actual technology. So token creation. At this time, it's very simple. 99.9% uh, .9 of people in the ICO market use an ERC-20 model. Um, they do have the capacity to use DApps, decentralized apps, to ensure that their technology can progress at a more rapid rate, as opposed to having to build that proprietary technology on their own blockchain. Um, the best thing about the token creation and what you need to understand is you need to look at the total amount of tokens they are going to be uh, creating because if they're going to dilute the market and have an exorbitant amount of tokens, there's no reason to invest in this ICO. What is going to happen is when they bring this into the open market, it's just going to be devalued because the amount of tokens are just too high for the ecosystem to sustain that value. What you want to look at is tokens around 100 million or lower for a utility token that has an actual use case in their technology. And you want to look at uh, larger scale tokens, so 100 million to 500 million, if it's a more broader application process, say a rewards-based system. Now, there is another type of token creation, which is uh, mintable. So essentially, they'll create a structured amount of tokens that they will do for their raise. And as more user adoption happens, what they will do is they will mint these tokens in relation to the new user adoption. So the pre-sale and the ICO structure. This is also very important. Um, I always advise anyone who is looking at investing in ICOs to wait until they've done their pre-sale. Any proper project that is going to move forward in this ecosystem should have the capacity to raise funds in a pre-sale method without having to go to the public. Having to go to the public for your pre-sale makes no sense in even doing an ICO because they're raising capital in the same structure they're going to be doing the ICO. So what is the benefit of the individuals who are going to invest at the ICO level when they could have just invested in the pre-sale? So classification of token. Um, we have this in uh, North America right now. It's an active, active discussion because of all the legalities. Essentially, you have two types. You have a securitized token, which they're trying to push through based on regulatory which is essentially the IPO structure. So it's going to be uh, diversification of assets. It's going to actually be equity in that company. And it's going to be a legal, regulated, only accredited investors. And uh, only institutional investors will have the capacity to invest in this token. Now, utility token is what I'm trying to push in the industry. In Canada, at this time, uh, they're still saying they may not have one. However, uh, utility token is where it's at. It gives the capacity for accredited investors, retail investors, run-of-the-mill investors to all have the capabilities of investing in this ICO without having to worry about regulatory issues and provides the founders of the token the capacity to raise this capital without having to worry about being slapped on the wrist with you know, regulations, securities laws, uh, regulators coming to the door. So, the best thing about an ICO, what you need to look at if you're going to be investing in it, is what is its relation to the blockchain and how is this technology going to be used in their business model? If it's just a guy coming out and says, hey, I have a retail store, I want to provide a token because I want to increase my uh, market share or market diversification, I'm going to use a token to raise funds and then I really have no use case for it and it's not going to progress this technology at all. Well, the, the initial investors may have interest in it just because they may see some uh, 
increase in value when it hits the open market. However, the in individuals such as myself who have been in this industry for six plus years, we look for things that are going to progress this technology. So we will not invest our money in something that does not have any relation to this industry whatsoever as opposed to just using it to raise money. So this is very important. Um, establishing where they are providing their message to the community. Uh, they should be using Telegram, Reddit, Bitcoin Talk, Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, any social media vertical, ensuring that they are actually pushing their message out shows that they have a very good vested interest in seeing this project succeed. Seeing it into, in news articles, ensuring that they're into traditional mainstream media. The biggest issue as well is ensuring that their message is being sent to the people in the industry that it's going to be most relevant to. So develop your roadmap. Um, the one thing that I always try to talk, tell my clients is, they always say, oh yeah, well we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. Well, we have to understand that you need to have a roadmap that makes sense. If you see this company come out and say, we need a hundred million dollars, and we're going to have our technology built within a month and a half. Well, technically it's probably not even feasible for them to even do that based on the uh, infrastructure internally on how it's going to have to be done. So ensure that the roadmap looks proper. Ensure that their project looks like it actually is feasible in the timeline that they have. If it's not feasible, I would not suggest investing in it. So the team. Um, this is the reason that advisors are very important. I've noticed a lot of ICOs come out now. Nobody has any blockchain experience. Nobody has any crypto experience. They just have business experience in what they're actually in, in their use case or, or their industry on what they're trying to raise capital for. Um, that doesn't mean the project is bad. What I would suggest is looking at the advisors that they get on board, researching them, and researching their actual involvement in the project. I know a lot of ICOs nowadays will say, hey, we have this guy as an investor, we have this guy as an investor, we have this guy as an advisor. But if you actually look at the capacity that they're doing, they're just a name on the sheet, and it doesn't mean that they actually have any practical uh, uh, say or structure into what's going to happen in that ICO. Find proper advisors. All right. I've already kind of discussed this before. Um, ensure that you communicate your goals to your audience. Uh, as I was saying, I would suggest if you're going to look at investing in ICOs, ensure that you invest in projects that actually ring true to you, something that excites you. Diversifying yourself and just throwing money at any ICO, essentially throwing it, it against the wall and seeing what sticks, is not a good model. Uh, diversifying yourself in crypto investments is a good model. However, diversifying yourself in ICO investments is not. SWOT analysis. So I always have my staff do this for every one of my projects, but this is also something you can do as a potential investor of any ICO, is do their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So go out, do a little due diligence before you actually provide your investment to them. What's their strengths in comparison to any other projects that are, you know, relatable in the industry? What's their weaknesses? Is there another project that is kind of similar that will see more progression and probably will see more investment because it makes more tangible sense? Uh, opportunities. See if there are opportunities and try and pose those questions to the ICO founders. There's always an open dialogue forum you can actually discuss with these individuals through Telegram, all the social media verticals. If you have questions on opportunities, leave it in their hands and see how they want to answer the opportunity. If they see it as a potential to uh, increase the uh, value of their project by listening to the community questions, then that's great. If they just dismiss it, I would suggest looking at a different ICO. Uh, threats. Essentially, threats are what's their security pro protocols like? Who is on their team that will ensure that this project is a success? What are the types of questions and information they're sharing with the entire industry and with the community? So how will your tokens be distributed? There's many different ways on how you can distribute tokens. Essentially, um, there's the model where it's like pre-search. Uh, you purchase the tokens, you create an account, 
They don't actually provide you with the tokens until the actual ICO is complete. However, they do showcase that you have your tokens inside your, uh, your user account. And they will be distributed when they actually finish their ICO raise. There is another model where you send Ethereum Bitcoin and you immediately receive your tokens back. Uh, that model is great. However, a lot of the individuals would much rather wait to be able to put those tokens somewhere where they can actually be used as opposed to just an Ethereum wallet and just let them sit there. So what payments will you accept? Um, the industry right now accepts crypto, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, etc. That's great. What I would love to see in the near future is more ICOs coming out willing to accept fiat. And the reason that I want to see more ICOs willing to accept fiat is it brings more fiat currency into this ecosystem, essentially increasing the value of the entire market. The more capital and cash that comes into this market increases the entire valuation. It's a great ecosystem, and I think it's a much better vertical for a lot of uh, new investors that want to get into ICOs that don't really understand how to utilize a wallet how to buy Bitcoin, where to buy Bitcoin, and how to transfer it. So legal representation. I know in North America it's very, very important. Uh, I myself have two law firms for all the projects that I do. Um, we have to worry about uh, the, the security regulators coming to my door. Uh, we have to ensure that all of our projects are uh, AML KYC compliant, which is very important. Uh, we have to ensure that the, um, the, the, we have to ensure that the regulators um, are happy with the structure. We have to ensure that they pass the Howey test. We have to ensure that they are classified as a utility, and if not, we have to register them as a security. So a good bounty program. A bounty program is great, and if an ICO does not have this, I would suggest staying away from it. The reason that a bounty program is important is it provides community involvement and interaction with crypto involved people, allowing them to progress the message and media of this token and creating more of a dissolution of the token throughout the ecosystem of individuals who are active in the community and provide more tradability on open exchanges and markets. Strategic partnerships. Uh, I myself have discussed this many times with uh, many of my projects. I would always, also always look for, when you do your SWOT analysis and you see that there's an opportunity, a strength, a weakness, a threat, look at C and see what they're doing. Oh look, this guy's doing the same kind of project. Well, if they're going to do a strategic partnership and work together and move to potentially partner with that project, it makes much more viable sense to invest in it because you see the capability of them to grow and evolve in this ecosystem. Marketing, I've already discussed this. So, establish post ICO relationships. I know we've listened to a few ICOs tonight. Uh, I thought it's really great when they say we've already discussed it with exchanges, we've already discussed it with XYZ company. Once we distribute our token, we already have all of these verticals as to where we are going to have our token distributed, allowing you to accessibly use it within the uh, entire crypto community. All right, that's the end of my slides. <laughs>